Good morning from Winnipeg, Canada, and good afternoon in the United Kingdom. On behalf of Conflict and Resilience Research Institute Canada, I welcome all of you to our 50th episode, which is very special for us this morning. And our today's webinar is titled Repatriation of Rohingya Refugees, a Game Theoretic Analysis. In today's episode, we have invited two distinguished scholars from the United Kingdom to speak on the subject matter. I shall introduce them with you shortly. Before we begin, let me do the treaty recognition. The Conflict and Resilience Research Institute Canada is located on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples, and the homeland of Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Ladies and gentlemen, and dear audience, as we begin our today's session, let me set the context very briefly. Rohingyas, one of the most persecuted ethnocultural groups in South Asia, had been fleeing genocide since late 70s in large number. As of today, they have sought refuge to more than eight countries in substantial number. Bangladesh being the largest host country where more than a million of them are currently residing. In the recent past, the year 2017 can be marked as the peak of Rohingya displacement, when as per UNHCR statistics, 750,000 of them fled to Bangladesh within two to three weeks. Now nearly after four years of their exile, if you consider the birth rate, camp population in the southeastern Bangladesh is hovering around 1.2 to 1.3 million. For our viewers, although Bangladesh is the host country by choice, it is one of the most populous countries in the world where 1,260 people live per square kilometer. The audience, our today's episode focuses particularly on repatriation using game theoretic approach. As such, let, let me share some statistics pertaining to the uh, displacement and related matters. As you see on the screen, dear audience, here is a very brief overview of the countries and the number of Rohingyas now residing. And as you uh, just heard, Bangladesh is the largest. And according to uh, this particular source, uh, the number is hovering an astronomical 1.6 million. And this particular document has been taken from UNHCR's latest release of displacement data. And as you can see, uh, total 16.2 million asylum applications registered through UNHCR system. And most importantly, I would draw your attention to the right bottom corner of the number where you can see 31.0 million internally displaced person returning to their place of residence within the past 10 years. And of course, see the staggering number of 754,500 people are stateless and obtaining or confirming nationality. And unfortunately, Rohingyas are one of them. This particular graph shows decade-wise repatriation number. As you can see, between 2010 and 2019, over the past 10 years, 3.9 million, according to UNHCR, could go back somehow into some stage of their original place of displacement. But as you see over the past uh, 30, 40 years, you will notice this, this decade is particularly, uh, the graphs show a very poor number of return and repatriation. As I was referring, just to give you a perspective, Bangladesh, uh, which is one of the most populous countries, as I mentioned, is actually four times uh, smaller in size than the province that I live in, uh, uh, which is called Manitoba. So given the size ratio, it is also very important to take notice that the, uh, the population of Rohingyas, how these are being accommodated in the host country. And I will end my uh, context by saying that uh, I hope our presenters would be focusing and showing some uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and discuss some of the matters, particularly the role of uh, international agencies in forecasting, thus preventing uh, this kind of unfortunate situation. And with particular reference to Rohingya uh, crisis in 2017, 
we have seen uh, this news came out in CTV News, one of the lead uh, channel in uh, Canada, and they have uh, shown that the UNDP country resident Renata uh, Locke de Zalian uh, has been recalled back to UN uh, because there were some issues in terms of forecasting the massive human displacement. So with this uh, little bit of statistics, I think uh, uh, the uh, set is seen. And um, uh, without further ado, let me introduce the speakers uh, as promised. Uh, our first speaker today is Dr. Mehdi Choudhury. Uh, Dr. Mehdi has a PhD from the University of Nottingham in economics. He also has a master's in economics from Ritsumaiken University, Japan, and a bachelor and master's from Dhaka University. He is currently working as the deputy head of Department of Accounting, Finance, and Economics. He, is a, uh, he has a number of publications uh, in the academic journals, such as International Development, Manchester School, Assessment and Evaluation in Higher Education. He also edited a book uh, in the South Asian Migration in the Gulf, published by Paul Grave. And uh, next, our uh, speaker uh, presenter is Dr. Abdullah Yusuf. Uh, he's a lecturer in politics and international relations at the University of Dundee, United Kingdom. And he studied public policy and diplomacy in the Australian National University, Canberra, Australia, and has a PhD in international relations from the University of Dundee. And his research and scholarship interests include refugee issues, statelessness, forced displacement, humanitarian response. And uh, uh, he also covers things like self-determination politics in Kashmir, East Timor, and Kosovo. Ladies and gentlemen, today we are also very privileged to have with us His Excellency, the Honorable High Com Commissioner of Bangladesh in Canada, Dr. Khalilu Rahman, along with our friends from International Peace and Diplomacy, Dr. Uh, Bizan Ahmadi. And we are expecting also some distinguished guests from Turkey and uh, uh, elsewhere. And finally, for our viewers, please join the discussion who have already tuned in by sending your question in our live feeds in Facebook and YouTube channel. And we'll be glad to share these with our presenters. So it's time to hand over the floor to uh, the first presenter, uh, Dr. Mehdi Choudhury. Sir, floor is yours. You can just unmute, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kausar Ahmed, uh, for a very nice introduction and also the giving, talking about the background of the Rohingya refugee crisis. It's really very helpful. And we are really very honored to be here uh, for this opportunity to present in front of this distinguished audience and also the people who are seeing, will be seeing the our presentation in Facebook and other medias. And before we, it's uh, obviously it's I am uh, just to mention about that that I am obviously one of the authors of this paper that we are going to present. The other author is Dr. Abdullah Yusuf, and he will take his turn uh, in in the presentation. Before we start presenting, uh, just after a while, I will uh, request Dr. Kausar Ahmed to share our slides. But uh, I just want to mention something in advance about some real matters of relevance. And it is that our paper, obviously, at our, that paper is addressing some issues and identifying some issues about repatriation of Rohingya refugees. And we kind to some extent uh, identified or evaluated the roles of the government of Bangladesh and also the international humanitarian bodies uh, in the in Rohingya refugee crisis specific to repatriation. Uh, but it's no way to undermine the tremendous achievement they have made in the management of the crisis as a whole. About a million people coming suddenly from, from Myanmar to Bangladesh. The government of Bangladesh and international bodies, uh, uh, as well as people who are from Bangladesh, uh, they really achieved, they done tremendously in this context and they should be praised and the, it is a well-deserved place. Uh, there is no, no uncertainty in our mind about that. Uh, that's, uh, and, but obviously, as a part of our research, we have identified some, some issues that we want to share that uh, with our audience. Um, that's, that's what I wanted to mention about before we start. Uh, now, uh, may I request uh, Dr. Kasset uh, to share the slides? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so this you can see about the, the paper from the title of the paper is Repatriation of Rohingya Refugees, a Game Theoretic Analysis. 
And uh, we, this paper is a joint paper that I mentioned that uh, I work with Dr. Yusuf. So I will just, after this introduction, I will hand over to Dr. Yusuf to uh, discuss about the context, questions, and the historical background of the, of the crisis and our paper. And then after that, I will take through the methodological part and I will discuss about the method findings and also some policy recommendations. Uh, so we'll, before we, I just want to show you one of, one photo that I have uh, actually the is to the uh, right side of the of the uh, presentation. It is a photo taken by me when I was visiting the Rohingya refugee camp in 2019 August. Uh, obviously, things have changed a lot uh, after that. It's almost two years from now. Uh, just uh, so that's it. I think that I can hand over to Dr. Yusuf now to take through the context and other relevant issues. Thank you. Dr. Yusuf, if you unmute kindly. Thanks, Mehdi. Um, is my sound okay now? Yes. Okay. Um, can you move to the next slide, please? Um, so just like, I mean, it might be a good idea if you cover the context of our paper. Um, so obviously Mehdi will cover uh, all the technical side of the story, especially the model we created. And then he will also cover the findings and any, any kind of policy advice for our um, future thing. Um, so the context is very straightforward. Basically, uh, since 2017, especially August 25, we saw like another 700,000 Rohingya refugees came to Bangladesh. Um, and so basically that made almost close to like 1.2 million Rohingya refugees are now basically stranded in Cox's Bajar. Uh, you can call them the, the largest refugee camp in, in, in the world. Um, so basically, so it's not only like 2017, uh, they've been coming here. They were here as well. So we saw like in 1978, then 1992, um, some of them who came in 1992, they are still in two of the camps uh, over the years. Uh, at one point, I, I saw the statistics in 2014 was 30,000 um, refugees were actually registered with the UNHCR during this time. Uh, so we are talking about like more than a million people now stranded in, in Bangladesh. And so Bangladesh is the host country. Uh, so these refugees cross the border. So Bangladesh is taking care of their food, shelter, uh, with the help of some of the humanitarian agencies on the ground. Um, so that's, 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 the, that's the picture. So obviously COVID created some of the problems there, but that's the current scenario. Uh, one thing we found through, the, um, through our research that um, over the years there were like meetings and all those negotiations, processes started and then stopped and started again. And one thing we found that it looks like in terms of the future, uh, there's nothing much there. Um, so quite a bleak picture we are, we are expecting. So basically the paper is actually built on around that uh, prospect of the future. Um, so which is linked with this like um, Rohingya refugees, future, 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 um, repatriation. So if you move to the second next slide, I'll, I'll try to see like, I mean, why, um, why we're actually writing this paper. One of the things uh, in terms of academia, if there is a gap in the existing literature, we try to explore that whether we can find way out to provide more, more understanding about a crisis in this case, um, Rohingya, Rohingya situation. Uh, so it looks like there is a limited resources there in terms of, especially the repatriation processes. Um, and we can see like over the years, we saw lots of media and all those outlets were like doing lots of news, lots of articles. But one thing, one thing was missing was, you know, proper identification of, of, of the obstacles. And, and like uh, in terms of the repatriation and also like how to overcome overcome them. So like these things are more or less lacking in terms of academia, in terms of like uh, popular news media or any kind of policy policy papers as well. So we just hope that you know, with our paper, 
some of those lackings will be kind of taken care of. Uh, so if you move to the next slide, please. Um, so I think so when you when you talk about Rohingya crisis, I think the Myanmar's troubled history is, is quite linked with that with that story. Um, so like just like a couple of just basic understanding. I think most of the things are like self-explanatory anyway. Um, so basically, it's a, it's a very multi-ethnic country, 135 ethnic groups recognized by the state. Um, so some of the groups are like, you know, so the obvious main groups are Burman, and then the Sheen, Kachin, Karen, Kaya, Mon, Arakanese, or now we can call them Rakhine, and the Shan. So if you look at the map in the middle one, you can see like all those states. So the, those groups got some kind of autonomy. So that's what they are called state. Uh, but again, like when you talk about self-determination, self-determination is all about the people will choose what they want. Uh, so the self-determination was more or less imposed from the center rather than from the from the periphery. So, so that's that's the problem area. So even if you look at the Myanmar's like earliest history, like even after like Second World War, uh, so even the founding father was assassinated. So that's Aung San Suu Kyi's father, Aung San. And then subsequently, there is a small kind of timeline for some kind of democracy, nation building. So in that timeline, more or less, you know, the country decided that they will work together, work together for this nation building. So the Rohingyas and all those groups are part and parcel of that nation building. So obviously, 1962, that the first uh, this like army rule started. And so if you talk about the army rule timeline, so that's basically 1962 after 2011. And then there's a small kind of quasi-democracy. Then the things started again in 2021, February. So that's a kind of very turbulent timeline. Um, in the meantime, so obviously this like Myanmar's, so obviously not, not recognized since 1982, um, more or less officially their, their citizenship been stripped off. Um, so, so these are the context when we, when you talk about like Rohingya crisis and the, uh, the you know the, the the country's outlook about this uh, group of people, um, so whether in the friendly nation or hostile nation, so we, this this history can give us some kind of perspective, like what's going on over the years. Um, some of the other maps are there, other facts and figures there. So these are like self-explanatory. So it's like Buddhist majority country, almost like ninety percent. Uh, the main groups are Burmese, so they are like sixty-eight percent. And Rohingya is like very tiny, tiny minority ethnic group, um, but more or less they are made outsider since 1982. Uh, so if you move to the next slide, um, I know like my time is very tight, so I'll try to go through some of this like basic understanding of this uh, Rohingya crisis. Uh, so if you look at the timeline, so if you start with like, so obviously the military rule, and then uh, so when they started, the, there are some kind of census in 1978 so well, one of the things they tried to find that who is in and who is out so like uh rohingyas more or less like they, they faced the first phase of the problem like 1978 but at the same time from 1962 onwards military rule did not help the like rohingyas like situation from 1962 onward more or less you know the in terms of national building they started from 1948 so that's the like total breakaway from that 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 view of of their future country. So like lots of Rohingyas being excluded from the army, from the civil service, from like day to day other jobs. So like by 1982, we saw like the proper legal backup there, more or less stripped off. Um, and then subsequently, we saw like 1991, 1992. There's another. So like every operation has got some kind of name. So we saw like 1978. They called it Operation Dragon King. 1991, the Operation Clean and Beautiful Nation. Um, I mean, so from like political scientists' point of view, so these are, uh, so these operations are actually not, are not nice if you are a minority in a very multi-ethnic country. Um, and then, so we saw like a couple of other small political upheavals in between like 2012, 2016, and the big surge came in 2017 when like 700,000 Rohingya people left their country uh, because there's serious amount of violence happening on the ground. Even like UN called it, this is like textbook ethnic cleansing. Um, um, so more or less, that's the like short 
short timeline here. So if you move to the next slide, I'll try to, so like these are the things we saw like, you know, since 2017, serious media outcry, uh, international community outraged. Uh, obviously, even his year has been on the ground for a long time. So like Bangladesh was like told that, you know, you have to open up the border because you know, there's a serious humanitarian crisis. Um, and the problem is once the border is open, cross the border, then it became Bangladesh's responsibility. Uh, so these are some of the pictures we saw like over the last four or five years. I mean, one of the things like, if you talk about like um, even hastier definition of protracted refugee crisis. So if the refugees are stranded for more than five years, and the numbers are actually 25,000, that become more or less protracted crisis. So we are heading for like 2017, this is 2021, so four years, and the army is more or less staying here, though they came with the idea that they will stay here for one year, but it looks like now they are saying that they are staying here for 2023. So it looks like the protracted situation is more or less fate accompli. So it's more than 25,000 people stranded and also is, 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 is heading for five years as well. Um, so if you move to the next slide, see like what else I need to cover. So like the po political outlook, 2017 onwards. So we saw like some kind of quasi democracy with this. So Anton Suki came to power since 2016. And then we saw like some kind of you know process there. Even like Obama came to like Myanmar for the first time as an American president. So the things were going you know well, but at the same time, it looks like on the ground in terms of Rohingya situation never improved, it looks like, even within this quasi democratic situation. Um, so like one of the things we talked about in terms of um, political science, someone called Buzan, Barry Buzan talked about this like secretization of a crisis. So like threat perception, sometimes, you know, when that, the threat is not there, but you kind of secretize over the years through his speech act and other processes. Um, so some of the things are linked with like colonial, you know, idea about, you know, divide and rule and all those things. So that the process since, since 1962, more or less by 2017, we saw like that's the culmination of secretization process, more or less completed. So uh, that's, the, that's the biggest surge, like it is the first time, you know, almost a, almost a million people more or less left the country. Um, and then we saw the, the final, I think the nail in the coffin was when Onsen Suki went to The Hague in the International Court uh, to defend our country and the country's policy against uh, Rohingya people. Um, and then obviously the post-coup 2021 February, more or less the politics is shifted to like more internal politics in Myanmar. So, so that, that's the kind of background, that's the backdrop we, we will kind of we are talking about in terms of Rohingya situation. So I think like Mehdi will take care of the rest of the, um, I think, I think presentation. So thank you so much. I think you're muted. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Yusuf, for a very nice background uh, given for the paper. And based on that, obviously, what we have discussed, uh, what uh, Dr. Yusuf discussed, we have this objective of the paper. We set it up like this that we first assess the prospect of repatriation through a negotiation between Bangladesh. With the Bangladesh, obviously, there are other actors like humanitarian bodies, uh, UNHCR, IOM, and obviously refugees are also there, and Myanmar. Is it really going to produce a result given the current scenarios? And then also we are going to evaluate the role played by humanitarian bodies before August 2017, and uh, we, in doing so, also, we looked at the refugee repatriation regime, the way currently the repatriation of refugees are managed or actually discussed. Uh, so that's the our, uh, our objective of the paper. So the refugee repatriation regime that we have currently is that it's kind of like dictated or it is uh, directed by the UN Refugee Convention that receives some amendments or modification later on. Uh, and so the one of the founding principle, main principle we often hear of is called non-refoulement or it is called no force repatriation. So obviously refugees, once they cross the border and now in the host country, host country not by, cannot by force return them. So that is called non-refoulement. It is kind of advocated by everybody and we definitely we have full support for that. 
also another another principle that is uh, very uh, well known is called voluntary repatriation we are also as authors we are also in full support of that voluntary repatriation mean not just repatriation that repatriation has to be safe and also has to be with dignity and in the refugee repatriation regime that is kind of the first preferred so we, we if you have a refugee crisis usually you want to see the repatriation is taking place following that uh, but then but what we see is as as mentioned by dr uh, kausar and also dr yusuf uh, before that we see protected refugee situation all over the world in last decades like say three four decades and instead of repatriation voluntary repatriation what we are seeing is rather integration to the host so the that is the country of refuge the the refugees are getting integrated or they are moving to a third country so for for settlement so that's instead of voluntary repatriation that's what we are happening seeing happening uh, more or less in the world uh, so based on that's our our take on the refugee repatriation so we will actually asking we'll be asking given this context uh, what uh, whether the, the humanitarian bodies should have actually foreseen that re voluntary repatriation is not possible in this in this existing scenario. Uh, so uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, so this is kind of like the finding of the paper, which I'm mentioning a bit in advance so that we are very clear about that. Obviously, this finding is informed by the analysis uh, later on, but uh, I just want to really mention it very clearly. These are the findings. So, uh, so me, that first is that Myanmar will not play the move repatriation. So that's it. We we are using a game theoretic term. So if we have a play, and the play is or is the action. The action repatriation, given the current scenario, will not be taken by Myanmar. And voluntary, we are saying that even involuntary, we are talking about a million refugees. You cannot just force them back. It's, it's impossible. So voluntary and even involuntary repatriation is not is impossible in the current scenario. Uh, now, and then we obviously, then the second, second question, uh, I think we have addressed in this paper through our qualitative analysis is humanitarian bodies should have foreseen the impossibility of voluntary repatriation well in advance of 2017 crisis. So that's kind of our, our uh, main findings of the paper. Uh, so the method we have used in our analysis, we have used uh, uh, the game theory, is you, many of you know about it. It's a mathematical model uh, is used to analyze games what is what is the meaning of a game in that context i will be discussing in the next slide so this paper is an application of uh, is coming the uh, we have used actually a model that is an application of game theory in international politics that model was first developed by brahms uh, in a journal called american scientific and th that model is called the theory of moves and that theory of move was used by ziegar and boscom and uh, and uh, to apply to the refugee crisis scenarios so i'm using a shorthand tom so that paper using tom for refugee crisis uh, was published in a very reputed journal called journal of conflict resolution uh, and then but we have not seen any other paper using tom to study the refugee crisis and not even rohingya refugee crisis actually we have not found any paper that used game theory to study rohingya refugee crisis uh, so next slide yeah thank you so what is game theory game theory uses a multi uh, analyzes a multi-person decision making issues where outcome of a participant's choice of action depends on the action of other participants now it may look uh, very complicated when i say like that but a very simple example is penalty shootout. So think about the outcome of the penalty, penalty shooter, goal is scored or not. It depends not just on the penalty shooter, not only just goalkeeper, it's that their actions jointly will determine the outcome of the of that, that act together. What they do, what they jump, what they kick, are they jumping fast, are they kicking fast, all things together actually determines the outcome. So it's not just one, it, it doesn't depend on the individual who is making the action, it depends also on the other person. So that's the game theory discusses, game theory analyzes that type of multi-person decision-making situation. So what is a game? 
Again, uh, you will have at least these three components. A game will have players. You can also say actors or you can say countries. So, but it's game because we're talking about using the term game. So players, it looks better. And we'll have strategies. Strategies, you can say actions or moves. And finally, we'll have outcomes, utilities, payoffs, or in this specific case, repatriation taking place or not like, like that. Now, we are arguing that the refugee repatriation scenarios can be viewed as games as all three components are present. Now, one of the things about game that they, we can almost almost everything explain everything in the human in the human world through game theory. Even the presentation that I am uh, I am giving it's a game because obviously I am presenter. You are listening. Others uh, sometimes you are nodding your head. Sometimes I am nodding my head. So we have all those activities going on. So that's this situation itself is a game situation. Uh, so obviously, naturally, uh, refugee crisis scenarios can be very easily explained by game, uh, explained as a game. Now, one thing to mention about before we go to the method a bit more is that so game theory as a mathematical model or as it in economics, it, it will talk about the structure of the game, we'll talk about equilibrium solution, we'll use very sophisticated mathematical models and which we don't use in this paper. Uh, rather, we are following game theory in international politics uh, and that use rather in international politics, we rather concern about game playing, how the game is actually played given some specific context. Uh, one of the very important uh, person actually can be named here is Thomas Schelling. Uh, he had a very famous paper called Strategy of Conflict, who, who was actually, he was awarded Nobel Prize in 2003 for his contribution to game theory. He analyzed uh, the Cold War scenarios in 1960s and was very influential at that time and still uh, is very influential. Next slide, please. Yeah. So. So the TUM model that has been developed uh, for international politics, and we applied that to the Rohingya refugee repatriation, uh, we have kind of very general model. And in the general model, we have two, two actors, two actors, one is the country of origin. Uh, if you apply that to the uh, Rohingya refugee crisis, obviously it implies Myanmar and the country of refuge. Of, if you apply it to the, uh, Rohingya refugee crisis, it mean, means Bangladesh, but it, it can also mean a number of actors in, in, uh, in the country of refuge together, which is Bangladesh uh, and say international bodies like IOM, UNHCR, and it can be also the refugees themselves together. But just for, for simplicity, we just assume two actors, country of origin and country of refuge. And we have studied four scenarios. And one scenario is where CR, CO and CR, CO is country of origin, CR is country of refuge, both are hostile to refugees on, on balance, on balance. Uh, and uh, then CO is, in second scenario, CO, CO is hostile, CR is friendly. And in the third scenario, which you, we also have given a name negotiation trap, which we think is more applicable to what we are seeing uh, in terms of uh, repatriation in the, in the Rohingya refugee crisis, which is CO is hostile and CR is friendly. And third is CO, fourth is CO and CR, both are friendly. We will see that the in all four, four scenarios, only in one scenario, ref, repatriation is possible, where CO is country of origin is friendly. So actually, the attitude of the country of refuge uh, has nothing to do with repatriation. It is entirely on how country of origin is actually viewing the repatriation. So that is our, our findings that I mentioned. But now, uh, Dr. Kassar, please, next slide. Now, these uh, are the, the tables through we analyze uh, uh, the, the uh, refugee repatriation. Uh, this obviously this kind of like the, there are four tables which uh, maybe we should first look at the first one on the top, which is titled as scenario one. Uh, and these tables, though they are they are very simple, but it actually takes some time to get used to reading those, uh, unless you are really familiar with uh, reading the tables in game theory. This this table is called a strategic form, but QM has also strategic form with uh, or say static 
more with the dynamic uh, model uh, in, uh, incorporated in that. So I will I will avoid uh, going through that discussion here. And so in this in this scenario, we have two players or two actors, country of origin. We assume the country of origin is hostile and country of refuge, which we also assume hostile. And country of origin has two actions, repatriate, do not repatriate. Can take the action repatriate or can take the action do not repatriate. Now, we remember that the refugee crisis has already taken place. The refugees have already crossed the border. Now, country of refuge has two actions available. One is assist. Assist means here assisting to food, shelter, and other services. Throw, throughout the all four tables, this is the meaning of the assistant. Assistance. Do not assist means that don't provide food and shelter, leave them as they are there. Uh, so now this is the this is the actions available to them. Now let us see what are the outcomes out of these actions. Now let us look at the on the top uh, uh, top right corner. We see the two actions in the scenario one: repatriate and assist. If country of origin plays repatriate and country of refuge plays assist, then the result is cell A. In cell A, it gives country of origin two, country of refuge three. So now by convention, as you can see in the cell, the numbers two and three, first number is always for the country of origin, second number is always for the country of refuge. Uh, that's how it is It is uh, written in the game theory uh, papers. And so, so this that means that the country of origin received the payoff of two, country of refuge received the payoff of three. And what is the meaning of two and three? We can interpret that as preference ordering or utility or satisfaction. And obviously, and now one more question is that how we get this number? How do you get this number? So how, what are the justification of assigning those numbers in those cells? Now we have actually obtained that through some discussion. We had some qualitative discussion assuming that the country is hostile or the country is friendly accordingly what will be the number given those outcomes for that country. Accordingly, we have those numbers one, two, three, four. And in the uh, scenario three and four, we have also numbers up to six. Uh, so I, I'm skipping again uh, the, how the numbers are derived, uh, that discussion, but that will be obviously explained in detail in our paper. So now these are the numbers we have, higher is better, just from that we, we take it. Now look at the status, we start the game at cell C, where country of origin plays do not repatriate, country of refuge plays assist. Country of refuge plays assist because assistance is actually, they, they think that is better to provide assistance, not, without, not, not even the country is hostile, we have some justification for that assumption. Now. So what is the outcome here for the countries? Country of origin makes four, country of refuge makes two. Now next move is to move to repatriate. What happens if the country of origin makes the move repatriate? In that case, the result moves from cell C to cell A and instead now country of origin makes two instead of four. So by making the move from do not repatriate to repatriate, country of origin act is actually worse off. Country of refuge is better off, but that's not the concern of the country of origin. Country of origin is only concerned about own country, not about the other country. Now, will the country of origin make that move? No, because it's there is no incentive to make that move. So what the country of origin will do? Country of origin will continue to have the move do not repatriate. That's the scenario one. Now here, important thing to note that we have assumed that the country of refuge is hostile. What happens if country of refuge is friendly? Then we move to this scenario two, uh, to the uh, top left corner. And in that case, again, the game starts from the cell C. And we remember, remember that the refugee crisis has already taken place. The refugees have crossed the border. And country of refuge provides assistance, country and the refugees are in the country of uh, refuge. Now, in this scenario also, from CLC, we need to, if through, through the move repatriation, the outcome moves from cell C to cell A. And this in that case, country of origin makes two instead of four. Again, country of origin will not make that move repatriate. 
So the game is stuck at cell C. So whether country of refuge is friendly or not, does not really matter. Now scenario three, we, we have a bit uh, more actions for the country of origin and we gave it name negotiation trap. Uh, country of origin is hostile, country of refuge is friendly. And in, now for the country of origin, we have three actions, repatriate, one action, Second action is show willingness and do not repeat yes. So it means that we want to discuss, but eventually do nothing. And the last one is do not show willingness and do not repeat yet. Now, we again, the game starts from the initial state at cell E, where country of origin makes, uh, makes five, country of refuge makes five. Now, given that situation, country of origin immediately makes the move show by showing willingness. Let's, yes, come to come for negotiation. And country of origin has no, refuge has no choice but to accept that call because it, it cares about the reputations in the international arena. Somebody is calling you for negotiation, you are not accepting that it's, it doesn't look good. So, but then then gets into the negotiation trap or of unnecessary, unnecessary negotiation without any result. And so, the game moves to the cell C, and where country of uh, country of origin makes six, and country of refuge makes three. Uh, but the next move, repatriate, it never takes place because then the game moves to cell A. Uh, but in that case, country of origin makes only two that the country of origin will not like. Six is better than obviously two. And so in all three scenarios, repatriation is not taking place. The country of origin is not making the move repatriation. Now, the last one is here, country of origin is friendly. Country of refuge is also friendly. Now, game here starts from cell E, but then it immediately moves to cell C, then moves to cell A because it's better for the, it's the, this is what is preferred by the country of origin. So in this specific scenario, uh, that's, uh, the repatriation takes place, country of refuge continues to provide assistance through whatever manner is available, and country of origin makes six, and country of refuge makes six. That is the best possible outcome. So that is the our analytical part of the paper. Uh, so next slide, please. Now, from that, we have these findings. Repatriation depends on the attitude of the country of origin. And repatriation does not depend on the attitude of the country of refuge. The country of refuge can be hostile, friendly, but don't pay attention to that. Rather pay attention to the country of origin that is dictating the repatriation. And as long as the country of origin is hostile, repatriation will not take place. And lastly, repatriation is only possible through conversion of the hostile country to a friendly country. Hostile country of origin to a friendly country. These are the, our findings. Uh, please, uh, next slide, please. So now, obviously, we have very general discussion. Now, obviously, the big question is that can we really identify a country like Myanmar, uh, hostile or as friendly? It's a big question, but obviously, uh, and it can be it can be contested. It can be discussed on a balance given what in the, the history of the refugee crisis and also what we have seen in last uh, Three, four years after the refugee crisis has taken place, uh, we cannot uh, cannot identify Myanmar as a friendly country for refugees. So ref uh, that's that's for sure. And on a balance, we may, we think that there there was certain degree of hostility to the refugee communities. Uh, that was evident from the way uh, they were depicting themselves in international arena and also social media uh, media uh, platforms. Uh, so, but this part is definitely, this is something to be understood whenever, uh, whenever we want to apply that to actual scenarios, uh, actual events. Uh, next slide, please. Now, we also address the refugee repatriation regime and we evaluated the role played by the humanitarian bodies. So we have this a bit comical diagram. Uh, it's two, two figures here, figure one and figure two which kind of shows the role of the national border. When we talk about refugee crisis, often we forget about there's a border there and that actually dictates how, how actors can really play their roles. Now in this figure one, we have two countries, country A and country B. We have used color code to show citizens. Uh, in country A, it's uh, blue and country B, it is uh, red. 
three people in country B, one is lying down, that person is the person in need. Now, if country B pro does not provide any assistance to can that person in need, country A cannot do anything because it, that's not within the border. Okay, and now, in the, that's that's the thing. If whenever you want to really provide assistance to someone inside the border of the another country, you need to get permission to do so. And that's that's the rule. That's two. You can provide support to one or two people, but not a million people, or not say a hundred thousand people. Uh, now, in the figure two, what we see that the this person in need has crossed the border, even the color is still red but the responsibility of providing assistance is now on the country A because the person is within that country. So that is the very important. Whenever we are actually looking at the refugee crisis, we need to really understand that role. And that happened in the Rohingya refugee crisis. Once refugees, they crossed the border, they came to Bangladesh, the responsibility came entirely on Bangladesh and on, on also the humanitarian agencies on the ground. And then that's that's what we are seeing still now. Uh, next slide, please. Now, from the, our the analysis of our paper, and we tried to explain some of them. The so that's uh, we can say that the actions to stop persecution of Rohingya should have been taken long time ago, and international community and Bangladesh Gov should have been briefed accordingly for informed policies well before two thousand seventeen. And the, uh, maybe they have informed, but uh, it was not in the media that much. And the burden of the crisis management is on entirely on the country of refuge. Here it is Bangladesh, and which actually is also a victim of the crisis through deforestation, physical and human capital utilization, local unrest, etc. Obviously, not of the same magnitude of the Rohingya refugees themselves. But, of, but still, Bangladesh is also a victim of the crisis. And Rohingya, what happened to the Rohingya? They moved from one unfortunate situation to another situation with no prospect of return on, in the horizon and seemingly no life chances. And uh, that's, uh, uh, yeah, one last slide. Though it is not really part of our paper, but people may ask this question, how the petition will take place. We think that a honest dialogue between parties involved will be very useful, which will be obviously Bangladesh, humanitarian bodies, uh, and international actors, the countries that are influential in the region, they can come together and have an honest dialogue. And then through that, they can actually identify the obstacle for repatriation. And then we also think that refugees need to be part of the dialogue so that they are well informed and they feel safe to return because we are obviously talking about the voluntary repatriation. So the refugees, they need to be convinced that it is safe to return. And I think that's our last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Mehdi. Uh, I would say I said it's a brilliant presentation and uh, my felicitation to both the speakers. So the audience will move to the uh, moderated Q&A session. And, uh, Today, uh, as I have already shared with you, we have uh, His Excellency, the Honorable High Commissioner of Bangladesh in Canada, Dr. Khalil Rahman. And I see uh, Honorable uh, Ambassador to, uh, of Bangladesh to Turkey. He is also in presence, uh, Mr. Ambassador Masood. So uh, we'll be bringing uh, first uh, the Canadian High Commissioner to the discussion uh, because he has a very deep interest in the uh, whole crisis itself. And uh, sir, if you kindly, uh, share your uh, ideas uh, based on the presentation and especially on the repatriation. And finally, I will bring uh, Mr. Bijan Ahmadi uh, if he wishes to join uh, in a moderated discussion. So, uh, so uh, Honorable High Commissioner uh, Dr. Khalil Rahman, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, no, it was really uh, uh, wonderful to be with you. So uh, first of all, I thank Dr. Um, Kausa to invite me and uh, the introduction given by uh, Dr. Isib and the presentation uh, by um, Dr. Mehdi Choudhury. Uh, I really am not very, uh, uh, very much aware of this theory, uh, game theories. 
But, you know, one thing I like to say, a couple of things I like to say, is that, you know, my colleague, Mr. Ambassador um, Musud Mannan is not here. I wish uh, he could uh, bear me out because um, he's my senior colleague. Uh, uh, and uh, we should really speak in one voice. Our position should be the same. So that's the that's the problem here. Huh? So I really wanted to hear from him. Anyway, so first of all, Bangladesh has a very stated principle foreign policy. The policy is friendship to all, malice to none. And uh, the scenario, the friendly or hostile uh, country for Bangladesh, every country we like to take as a friendly country. Because to us, Myanmar is not a hostile country. We are transacting with uh, Myanmar. We have different regulations with Myanmar. So this friendliness should be defined, whether the friendliness to the refugees or to the countries. Suppose, OK, Myanmar definitely not friendly to refugees. But Bangladesh does not consider, consider that Myanmar is hostile to Bangladesh. So this is one observation. Secondly, I think in the beginning, uh, uh, the paper identified uh, basically three parties, Myanmar, UN agencies, and Bangladesh. Uh, UN agencies cannot be a party in the negotiations. Yes, they are playing a role. And they are playing a role. And sometimes I'm very blunt to say that the UN agencies are, I think, uh, one of the main obstacles in repatriation. I worked in the UN system. I know the colleagues in the UNHCR and many uh, uh, organizations. Sometimes they themselves like the problem to be protected, to keep their job and to be around and to be seen useful. My question is, when the UNHCR, the, the High Commissioner for uh, Human Rights say, this is a textbook ethnic cleansing is UN trying to use this word this is their word why they are not going to the developed countries those who cry for human rights those who cries for protection of vulnerable people what they are doing they are not doing anything they are only going to them for more support so that they can sustain the refugees. We do not, uh, first of all, this is another very uh, elementary uh, issue. We do not consider Rohingyas as refugees. They are forcibly displaced Myanmar nationals. So this thing should be very clear in the beginning. So that refugee convention of 1951 does not come to play here. So they are temporary uh, uh, people who are sheltered in camps in Bangladesh. They have to go back. They are not refugees. So we do not, Bangladesh does not want to give them any right under that convention. So UN is not playing their part. UN is going anywhere, everywhere. We, are, we also went, went with them that, OK, now we, to support them, uh, that should be support from the uh, international community. The country I am working in, they have placed 338.4 million uh, Canadian dollar for three years, basically to be spent in the humanitarian uh, areas of their four stated uh, areas of work, the, the, of the Canadian government. But it has been proved that it is already a protected issue, spanned already over four years. I don't know how many years it will go. The area we believe Bangladesh wants should be focused by Canada and by any developed nations is to make these perpetrators accountable, including this pseudo democratic leader Aung uh, San Suu Kyi. She is a bigger evil than the Myanmar generals. The OST is so stupid. They still does not want to accept that. Suki has proved that she is the devil. Under her watch, this persecution, genocide took place. And she has proved this, vindicated her involvement by defending the case in the ICJ. If you look at the history of the 
Rohingya issues. Uh, as the graph uh, shows, always there are so-called displaced people from Myanmar to Bangladesh, and most of them were taken back until 2012. But when Suki came to power, no refugee was taken back. And then the worst thing started in August 2017, the mass influx. So whatever repetition are possible, those are possible during those army generals, not under the democratic regime led by Suki or she being this uh, so-called state councillor. So with Suki, nothing will happen. And West is still trying to legitimize Suki and to really exonerate from the crime she has committed uh, in, in 2017. So this is, this is another observation. Uh, in terms of uh, repetition, you know, again, I go back to uh, this UN agency. Now, we are uh, trying to do some work with uh, uh, Mr. Ahmedi's organization and with other organizations uh, who were joins us. Uh, this country, Canada, even now the USA also and the EU, they are, you know, uh, crying, dying for environmental protection and preservation. What happened in the camps in Cox's Bazaar? They have raised the ground the hills, cut the trees, acres after acres of land, and their mom. They don't talk about environmental presentation, uh, preservation and protection, and they want more lands. So for them, repetition is not a priority. So that's why I think I agree to some extent, at least uh, for, uh, for the time being, theoretically, that the repetition may take some time, but one thing is very clear. Bangladesh has always said no, is saying no, and will always say no integration of Rohingyas in Bangladesh. You know, uh, uh, the two gentlemen, the author, they are from the UK. And uh, your country is this, um, I think, Deputy Minister or State Minister, I don't know, uh, Lord Ahmed or Ahmed Lord. Huh? Uh, this gentleman called for, you know, an international place summit to sustain Rohingyas in Bangladesh. UK is the country that created all the problems around the world. And he is trying to create another problem by, you know, by convening this international you know, place summit and taking money and making arrangement uh, for Rohingyas continuing stay in Bangladesh. This UNSCR is the organization that tried to convince all the year agencies that no Rohingya should be shifted to Vashansar. Uh, Dr. Ahmed has given the population density in Bangladesh, in other developed countries, even in this country, the four persons per square kilometer in Canada, the population density, whereas Bangladesh, we have uh, 12, 1200 plus. The question is that when we tried to help the Rohingyas, this is too congested. We developed a, a, an island at Bhashanswar, spending our own money, 450 million US dollars. And that too, uh, developed by a UK company. And how UK, UK or other countries can say that it will submerge? Then, then you did something wrong when you developed the land, I mean, the island. And this UNHCR, they tried their best to stop the transfer of 100,000 Rohingyas to Bhashanswar. And I'm so sorry to say that, very sad to say that they used Canada to impress upon, to convince government of Bangladesh not to send them. And Canada's uh, High Commissioner, he was on the forefront. So I have serious doubt about the intention of, of these developed countries, about the repatriation. Bangladesh has been trying to get financial support contribution from these countries so that the case brought out by Gambia in ICJ is, is, is supported and we make the perpetrators accountable and to create a secure 
held the environment for Rohingyas to be repatriated to the Rakhine state of Myanmar. Uh, I think my uh, statement is not uh, organized. I'm just, you know, saying all this, uh, you know, from my you know, <laughs> so-called little knowledge of uh, Istanbul. So I'm not really as good as these authors, you know, they are very structured people. So I think in the in the in the context of the paper, I think we have to uh, see whether and how uh, this uh, the 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 UNSCR and the UN agencies role come in because they are playing doubtful role. And you know, as uh, Dr. Mehdi said, uh, that the uh, repatriation should be voluntary. Yes, I, I I agree. I work in the UN. This this should be the case. But even when many Rohingyas agree to be repatriated. These NSCR UN guys went to them, don't go, don't go. Stay here. They created contribution. And they are just, you know, unfortunately, uh, the people who, who are at the big position of these organizations, they're very, very uh, close to these developed countries and they fit all the information. Okay, you should you should you know say this thing and those guys come here uh, uh, together. No, you can't do this, that, this. So that is one thing that we have to ask for accountability of the UN agencies working there. We, we are a very friendly country, not only with our you know um, 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 with other countries, but also with uh, international communities, including the UN agencies. We are working with them. We like to work with them, but. The fact remains that we believe in transparency, we believe in neutrality, uh, and uh, whatever way we can work together uh, and definitely upholding the dignity of the refugees. Uh, so that will be our position. But last and uh, um, the, the, the basic point is that Bangladesh is not for Rohingyas. Bangladesh is for Bangladeshis. They are temporarily sheltered in Bangladesh. They have to go back sooner or later to their homeland. And I think international community, including the agencies, they have a role to play. How to ensure the healthy, uh, to create healthy environment in, in, in the Rakhine state. And that's why uh, I think we need to start a process of dialogue for peace. How peacefully, not only Rohingyas, uh, the paper also identified other ethnic groups, even in the Rakhine state how all the ethnic groups can live in peace within the sovereignty of Myanmar. Bangladesh believes in territorial integrity and, and, and sovereignty. Bangladesh uh, is not crazy like some uh, US senators or uh, uh, congressmen who said that, you know, this Rakhine state should be independent on all the Rohingyas can go. We don't believe in that. We believe in territorial integrity of Myanmar. I think within the uh, sovereign territorial uh, structure of Myanmar, uh, a neutral zone or an independent uh, state can be created through a dialogue, through peace process, where all the ethnic groups, including the Rohingyas, can live in peace. That's 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 my you know very simple uh, uh, you know answer. And I'm so sorry that you know I had I I, I, I spoke uh, from my mind, uh, so it might not be very pleasant for some. But you know, that's how I speak. And that uh, what I will speak always. Thank you so much for inviting me once again. And thank you, uh, uh, this distinguished author, Dr. Isuf and Dr. Choudhury uh, for the wonderful paper. I really like to read it because, you know, I, I, I really like to read it because this game theory is very interesting. And one thing I, I have a doubt, I think you said that, you know, uh, this theory works uh, considering the action of other. And uh, that, that's why, you know, I, I have, we have some problem that because, you know, Bangladesh does not believe in game. Bangladesh believe in true dialogue, that how true dialogue with transparency, with all kind of, you know, accountability, we can work together. Huh? But nonetheless, I'll be very pleased to see the paper. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honorable High Commissioner, uh, for your remarks. I think uh, these are worth pondering. Uh, I, I mean, we are just at the last uh, segment of the session and I would not like to hold the uh, presenters uh, for long. Uh, just a quick question, though, uh, to both the presenters uh, from my side is uh, you did mention out of the four scenarios that you presented uh, with the metrics, 
Um, the third one I'm very interested in is uh, what you titled negotiation trap. So uh, the question is uh, possibly uh, if I can frame it in that way, how, what do you suggest uh, uh, in terms of actors and their actions uh, so that uh, you know the stakeholders or, or the parties do not get into the negotiation trap and get into a form of dialogue which would continue years and years yielding nothing. So what do you see in the literatures and the examples uh, in the past history uh, so that the negotiation trap doesn't happen? Uh, shall I respond? Uh, so thank you, Dr. Kausar, and thank you, Honorable uh, High Commissioner, Dr. Rahman. Uh, it's your, I mean, that your comments that you made was very honest, and that's what actually we, we like to see. And we, I think that one thing I would like to first uh, make it clear is that hostile or friendly, we did not mean it to each other, we meant it to the refugees. Uh, so in our paper is the country's attitude toward refugees. Uh, so that's what was clear to, uh, was what I, we mentioned, wanted to mention about. And we, what we wanted to study is that, is it possible to have repatriation within existing scenarios? It's not about, we did not discuss about third country settlement or settlement in the host countries, whether we actually wanted to study that given the existing situation, is it possible to have repatriation in the near future? And that's what we actually looked at. So given what we have mentioned in the paper, that given existing scenarios that we see in Myanmar, repatriation is unlikely in the near future. So that's why we need to have this conversation within within Myanmar, uh, with Myanmar, Bangladesh together. It had, and one more thing is about the, about game, is that game is, we we, we kind of like, we treat this term is, as a negative term, but game is not actually a negative term. It describes a situation. Like I am talking to, it is also a game. Like uh, Dr. Rahman, he was asking some question or he was making some comment. I am responding to that. That's also is a game. So everything that we are doing, human to human conversation, that is a game. So it's not about, it's not as a bad thing. It's the game theory is actually starting the game. And this is where we have repatriation is a game because obviously you have to have negotiation between parties. So we are trying to study that situation. So now game playing, how do you play the game? That's another question. Here comes to the next point raised by Dr. Ahmed is that negotiation trap. Maybe you want to, in one party may have some hidden agenda, may not really show that, want to show that, yeah, we are very willing to take them back, but actually not. So coming to the, coming to the meeting, but actually not doing anything afterwards. So that is a game that, that, uh, that can be played. And we think that, this is something is also going on with the Rohingya refugee repatriation. And uh, that the Bangladesh started to have negotiations, started to have uh, some kind of agreements, two official agreements and many visits. But then what, what happened in terms of the actual return that did not take place because Rohingyas themselves, they were not perceiving Myanmar as safe to return because it, the, the country, they have suffered persecution for 40 years. They, how, what changed suddenly that they will believe that the country is friendly in just three months? That's, uh, they would not really accept that. So that's kind of things we actually wanted to address in this, uh, in this paper. So that is what we mean by negotiation trap. You go into negotiation that is not going to any, give any result. So about how to avoid negotiation trap in the future. So le learn from the lessons in the past. Don't come through the meeting unless you really have clear confirmation of what is going to happen. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Dr. Mehdi. Uh, Dr. Abdullah, do you have a complimentary comment? Um, I mean, since I have to leave like within two, three minutes, uh, but just like add a couple of things. So like from the political sciences point of view or IR, IR international relations point of view. It's like more like if you see that like tangible evidences, even after 2017, 2018, Onsen Suki was saying that, yes, we are ready. It's just Bangladesh is not ready. And then if you see that all those like lip services, subsequently, like everyone is like, you know, and then at one point, oh, it's like COVID now, you know, the infrastructure is not ready. And then bus is not ready. So this, 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 these, are, these are the classical, you know, 
this like negotiation trap and then you can just go on and on um, and the problem is like once the protracted situation you are in you are stuck there and you can see the, the the world history in terms of this like a protracted refugee crisis if you look at the palestinian situation or like any other situation is it just stays there forever so i'll just like this my two pens so i um i have to leave i have to go for another meeting so like thank you so much for the opportunity so thank I'll, you, I'll, I'll try to talk with everyone thank you thank you dr Thanks abdullah so ladies and gentlemen we have with us uh, uh, Honorable Ambassador uh, of Bangladesh to Turkey, uh, Ambassador Masood Mannan. Uh, sir, would you like to um, add some comments because you are in a country which is in the top of the list of hosting Syrian refugees in the world in terms of number. And you might have uh, observed our presenters uh, speaking about a game theoretic approach. And I find, sir, you are also uh, have attended in the past National Defense College, probably in Bangladesh. Sir, so floor is yours. Uh, if you kindly unmute. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, this is my first day with your group. Before we actually join as a speaker, the main thing is to learn more about the philosophy of the group and its members. So I will not be long. I will just have some, make some introductory comments. I will not go into detail because I have to first study your group and then make the comments according to the expectation of the group. But as a new ambassador of Bangladesh to Turkey, and from my experience of working with similar issues when you know, I was working in Bangladesh as a senior uh, officer of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, senior diplomat. Uh, I can say that uh, Turkey has been handling the issue of Syrian refugees in its, with its difficult, uh, sorry, difficult, sorry, different philosophy and different way of dealing philosophy as well as dealing differently. You can ask me why. Because we shouldn't forget, today's Turkey is just a big province of the previous Ottoman Empire or Seljuk Empire. <laughs> it's not the real, very, very big you know, country they used to have. At that time, these people, who are now refugees in, if it was before, say, the beginning of last century, not this century, they were the citizen of the same big empire. So feelings for them is actually totally different because only under the Ottoman Empire, they were more than 700 years together. I'm talking about the Syrian people as well as the people of Antalya, I mean, where Turkey is now, today's Turkey. So they have a more deep-rooted philosophy and understanding and way of dealing with them. When they started coming here from 2000, you know which year, they actually, at that time I was ambassador to Germany. So you have seen not only Turkey, Germany also welcomed them with an open arm, but German are not related to them historically as much as Turkey has been. So there is a big difference in the mindset when the people of Turkey welcome them. It is not just only on humanitarian approach or consideration. It is something more deep-rooted like culture, religion, and being together for thousands of years before I'm talking about from maybe the Seljuk time or even before. I have to learn more. So that's why I'm telling you, we have to think these things very seriously when we talk about Turkey dealing with Syrian refugees. After coming here to deal with my people who sometimes come here and need embassy assistance, you know, on their way maybe to some other country in Europe, when I discussed the matter with their migration department, 
they have a big migration department under the interior ministry, like our home ministry. And they also have a big office like we have of the IMO. I met both of them, both the DG, the officers of the migration department of Turkey, as well as the boss, the country representative of international migration organization. Uh, in both the places, they also reminded me about this fact. And they say the Turkish people, because they consider them as almost family member, they have opened up even schools, houses. Uh, at the beginning, when they just came, relief camps with different mentality. And they actually started to integrate them within the society. Because don't forget, just after the First World War, actually everything changed. Before that, they were one country. And it is not even, it has just been 100, say, four years, if you take into consideration 1917, or even a little later, 1919. So 102, 104 years is not a long time, because there were seven, 800, or 1,000 years to get. These things are very important. As a career diplomat working in different countries where there are different challenges of migration, refugee, and other problems when people move for war or for famine or for other reasons, you know, political reason of division, you know, even there are within the neighborhood of Turkey. I don't want to mention the name, you know, very recently there were challenges as well. So this is one thing we have to consider. Then when we go to think about, uh, you, uh, you will ask me what kind of integration they did. They did say, when in our country or in, 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 in other country where you have displaced population, you will start thinking how to tackle the situation because they are not solely of the same culture of your country. You have to uh, consider and treat the thing according to their nature of culture, religion, and need. But here it is almost the same. They are not big difference. So I have seen when I met the Red Cross, what do you call international Red Cross and Red Crescent Society people here, uh, and also the ICRC, both, I met both actually. First, I met in Antalya very recently in the, what do you call, uh, diplomatic forum. You know, there was in June. And the other one I met even before, ICRC office. They both were also thinking that Turkey is doing a fantastic job because they are treating them as their kids and kings, which is not happening in many countries. So these are the two points I wanted to tell you. One, they are already part, they were already only 100 years back, part of the same empire. And number two, the culture is not very different. Not that they are not Muslims, or not that they are not Arabs, or West Asians, as they call themselves sometimes. You know that. They call themselves West Asian people. So there are lots of similarities. And now I'm trying to also study further because very recently, you know, after I came, I think one or two months back, they found that there are even older, I mean, even uh, examples of older civilization, more older than Egypt found here, like China found a couple of years back, seven, eight, 10,000 years old. Recently, two, three months ago here in Turkey, they found 12,000 years old civilization. So when you will go into that deep, just think. Now we are talking about even another new dimension, not just religion, but also deep rooted civilization, which is, you know, there is a difference or there is a dimensional change when you take into consideration civilization, culture, religion, they are, uh, they are, you know, related to each other, but they have their own dimension. 
That's why we don't call everything culture or everything religion or everything civilization. They have their own impact. So as a researcher, our friends who are gathered here today with us, I will request you to take into consideration because I told you I will not go further. I'm new here, only nine months and pandemic is going on. I couldn't travel too much. I didn't go to that 12,000 years old spot. I only went to the 6,000 year old spot, like a similar uh, age like Egypt, but I didn't go. Inshallah, I will go. Inshallah, I will have more information to share with you in the near future. And I was, I'm also planning, since you are based in a wonderful country, I'm also planning to do something with Irsika on Rohingya crisis, the challenges they are facing after being displaced in a big number in 2017 August. So inshallah, I will invite you then. It will be happen, I think, by the end of this year. I've already started talking with Dhaka University, Irsika, and one or two organizations in Turkey. So please pray for me and let's remain in touch. I am sure I couldn't make you very happy today because I didn't have any background paper or I didn't know all the members. I only saw my colleague, Dr. Khalil Rahman present here. Others are, maybe, maybe I know a little bit, others are all new. So inshallah, in the next program, if I'm invited, we'll come more prepared and I will request both of you, uh, Dr. Kasar Hamed and Dr. Mehdi Choudhury, to send me background papers or links so that I come more prepared. Today, Mehdi Choudhury only told me, you can be a part of the room and please be present. I was not told that I have to give a presentation or make some comments, but thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable High Commissioner. It's a pleasure to have you, sir, uh, finally with us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have a very fond memory of, of Turkey. And just to share with the Honorable Ambassador there, uh, Mr. Masood Manan, uh, I was uh, in Turkey between 95 and 6, two years as an exchange student officer with Turkish army. And uh, therefore, I have learned the language. I have a diploma and I still follow Turkish news. And as I said, it's a very fond memory with Turkey. So uh, I'll uh, just uh, uh, conclude the session here after the uh, Honorable Ambassador's speech. Uh, uh, it's very interesting to find these perspectives today, uh, right coming out from Dr. Mehdi's uh, paper and also uh, from two veteran career diplomats of Bangladesh working in two very important countries, Canada and Turkey, and which are in the forefront of uh, many of the humanitarian assistances and interventions. Ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, I would like to just uh, summarize uh, the necessity of uh, game theoretic approach in the policy side. Uh, as you have listened and observed Dr. Mehdi's uh, presentation, he presented a uh, game theoretic approach in dealing with the situation. And I, I would think that it is mostly on the intervention side and how the negotiation, future negotiation should take place. In this regard, I would also like to share with the audience that in Oslo peace process, which started in early 90s, and there's a movie also, Oslo, uh, just titled Oslo, and it's a very interesting um, uh, movie, which uh, uh, documentary, I would say, and which own number of awards. The key point of this movie is how negotiation through the back channel actually starts, and it goes and changes the minds of, of the, I would say, stringent political leaders, those who do not want to come to the table and etc. So this this second channel or the or if you might say 2.5 channels are also very important. And uh, I'm sure the presenters uh, have spoken uh, in their paper more details about those aspects as well. We have listened to uh, Honorable High Commissioner of Canada, Dr. Khalil Rahman, uh, about uh, the uh, bilateral and multilateral uh, negotiations and its futility so far. And we would also like to say that um, the displacement of Rohingyas have created a lot of challenge for the host country. It is fourth year on to August 25th. It would be the fourth year of the uh, you know final exodus uh, from the country. And over these four years, as you have heard Dr. Khalil Rahman, that environmental degradation is at its peak. And I'd also like to add that intergroup conflict is also brewing up pretty fast. 
demographic security threat. We have uh, uh, have evidences uh, happening in the southeastern part of the country. And of course, uh, these things should be taken into consideration in terms of intervention. So um, at the end, I would like to once again uh, thank Dr. Mehdi Choudhury uh, for coming in and taking this uh, enormous initiative to present us a very new approach, I would say, in terms of intervention. And we'd like to uh, listen more from his work. And we'd like to finally also thank uh, uh, the honorable ambassadors from Turkey and Canada uh, to, to be with us for last one hour and 25 minutes. And uh, with this, I would like to uh, conclude this session. Thank you, Dr. Mehdi Choudhury, and thank you, ambassadors, for your kindness and your presence. I uh, would look forward to being in touch with you. And uh, we'll just uh, end this session uh, with our short video clip. Until then, uh, goodbye and stay safe where you are.